Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Hey, Matt. Yo. How are you doing? Yo, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Matt, that's great. We're here another week, Mm -hmm. and I hate to admit it, Matt. Hate to admit it. What is it, Jaron? But... Our boy Wallet Coon, oh, no. not doing so hot after oh, this no. weekend. Oh no, Jaren, Jaren, who was who was Wallet Coon attacked by? Matt, this weekend was the annual Fan Expo here in Toronto, which is essentially this big, Matt, as the mm-hmm. name implies, this big expo that really revolves around fans of all types of genres, whether that be gaming, mm-hmm. manga anime you know the gr- movies tv just letting your not mm-hmm. dare i say inner freak flag fly <laughs> uh-huh. in the company of your peers and other enthusiasts and what this was the first time i've gone to a fan expo here in toronto and that mm-hmm. as weird as it sounds over a decade so mm. For me to run it back 10 years later, it's just as I remembered where I think the reason we got tickets this year was we were running off that high of attending Toronto Comic Con earlier Mm -hmm. this year as Mm -hmm. well, where stepping into Fan Expo, you sort of realize how much of a bigger uh, overall event this is in between the multiple halls, the multiple exhibitors, and just everything going on where I personally like to go to these conventions, these expos, mainly to shop around the vending district because Matt, Mm -hmm. not a fan of trying to be activated. (laughs) If a booth or an activation has a short enough line i'll maybe you know scurry up like the rat i am grab Mm -hmm. whatever free sample there is and scurry on out of there Mm -hmm. where for me personally it is just going around to the different vendors trying to survive in artist alley and really just people watching seeing all the great cosplay and just people having a good time because matt Mm -hmm. one of my you know, down the list of things I like to do at these cons is to leave a bit early, take a walk of the perimeter of the venue and kind of see all the different cosplay meetups happening where when I immediately left during the Sunday, I looked to my left, Matt, over in the field, I saw the haiku group meetup (laughs) and people Uh were playing volleyball and that made me (laughs) feel real good, Matt. Mm. where I think my only real regret was we went the Sunday and for Toronto Mm -hmm. Comic Con, we went the Saturday. But the reason we went on the Sunday was because tickets were notably cheaper compared to Saturday. Uh, But then the unfortunate thing is Sunday means the weekend is over. And Matt, Mm -hmm. Saturday morning, the Saturday morning arcade clubhouse, not to dox ourselves, the Saturday morning arcade clubhouse and the Mistake Zone HQ, not necessarily in Toronto. So that means Mm -hmm. have to traverse back home. And that means got to, if I want to avoid the afternoon, evening traffic, got to leave a bit early. So Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The only bummer is we spent a good three hours there, kind of wouldn't have minded spending a bit longer there just to kind of see everything, all the other halls. We mainly stuck to, I believe, Hall F, which was the vendor area in the artist alley, Mm -hmm. and just kind of explore, people watch a bit more. And I think what I normally don't do when I go to these events is that I don't necessarily line up for the different panels, the different, you know, theater events where some of them did sound a bit interesting, but maybe when we have more time on our side. But Mm -hmm. that's not why we're here, Matt. We're here to talk about my addiction to consumerism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Matt, Mm -hmm. with the amount of cash I withdrew over the weekend, gotta (laughs) say, 
I'm really I'm really disappointed in my bank, Matt, because <laughs> uh-huh. they did not flag me for my <laughs> egregious <laughs> cash withdrawals over the span of two days. So Matt, pretty oh, alarmed. Man. Pretty alarmed. I don't know. Jeremy, maybe they have, you know, some software that's like, oh yeah, you know, oh, what do you call it? He's like withdrawing money from downtown toronto and fan expos this weekend yeah that 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 you know cross analyzes correctly with what we've seen him spend money on before this tracks on the algo but matt Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know what always boggles my mind about these type of events Hmm. is artist alley where Mm -hmm. matt Mm -hmm. i really (laughs) i'm of two minds of artist alley one they really need to find a better solution to how an artist alley is organized where I understand that a booth costs a lot, especially for something like Fan Expo, where mm-hmm. I know the vendor booth specifically is like two grand for the entire weekend. And I'm not sure if the artist alley booths are a bit cheaper. I would hope that they are. I didn't look into that regard. But the way the artist alleys are set up is you have these rows of vendors or artists in Mm -hmm. to compose of an alley where usually it is the fan artists kind of making these rows Uh, you have all these different vendors facing each other and then on the perimeter of the artist alley area i feel like that's where they put all the different comic creators all the graphic artists and people who have their works published where Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you think the graphic comic artists feel type some type of way where everyone has to trek through the fan artists to get to them i mean probably not i feel like you know i feel like they know that they are the the like what's it called you know how like in in grocery stores they put like the really important stuff in the back so you have to like trudge through everything else fair the, and they you know they they I don't want to say con you into buying other stuff because I don't want to make it seem like, you know, fan stuff is stuff that you're conned into buying. Yes. But <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I'm not trying to take away from said fan artists, but I feel mm-hmm. like there is a different vibe, I guess is what I'm trying to say, when you have all these people trying to push their original art, their original content. On the flip side, you have a lot of fan artists who are just, you know, creating essentially doujins and fan art of mm-hmm, their mm-hmm. favorite brands where matt mm-hmm. once again genshin characters on lock yeah. uh we have a lot of boat bochi care a lot of bochi fan art out mm-hmm, there Matt. Mm-hmm. That tracks. and unfortunately i don't want to say unfortunately but did see a lot of hollow live related vendors but matt all all mm-hmm. centered around hollow yen where you know that makes sense. Shot, shot my shot with a lot of them and i say do you have any hollow id fan art there no mm-hmm. dice, Matt. No dice. Mm-hmm. Where I wasn't expecting to get anything from Artist Alley because, to be honest, Matt, when I say uh-huh. I wish there was a better setup for said Artist Alley, it's if one particular vendor has a big interest within the fan artists, that just mm-hmm. creates this big, big kind of roadblock. And yeah. it's just... Honestly, Matt, Artist Alley's, I've never had a good Artist Alley experience. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's always too busy. There's always a roadblock and no one's really moving. It's hard to get through the alleys. And Matt, uh-huh. if you lose one of your party members, yeah, having to do the snaking through all the different alleys, especially if you're trying to find like a particular booth, not the greatest, Matt, not the mm-hmm. greatest, mm-hmm. but the reason I brought it up is, you know, when we were trying to find a party member were snaking through the booths and I was looking at all the different fan arts, all the let's face it, man, all the different Genshin fan art. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then I see this one booth where I see this recognizable lime green. <laughs> and Matt, uh-huh. I see our girls, Mitsu and Aya from the guy she was interested in wasn't a guy at all. Mm-hmm. And Matt Mm-hmm. Honestly, totally surprised that I found a Mitsu I, uh, you know, just fan art out and about. Yeah, yeah. And I had to, I had to, mm-hmm. Matt, where had to shout out the artist. Mm-hmm. I believe their tag is Peachy Paru on Instagram. And Matt, a lot mm-hmm. of the different artists, a 
medium print was usually $20. Asked her how much Mitsu Aya was. Uh, they told me 15 had to mat, have to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was actually really surprised because I was looking through all their different mercs, all the Mitsu Aya keychains sold out. The, and Matt, she uh-huh. he said, hey, take a picture of my business card or whatever, my artist card, and keep an eye out for future Mitsu Aya drops. <laughs> oh, they man. know their audience, Matt. <laughs> they got you, Jared. They got you. They got and you. And I am part of said audience where, um, you know, I went around the different vendors, got a pop-up parade figure of I from Oshinoko. Mm -hmm. A good price, Matt. Essentially paid no tax. So when you consider Japanese shipping, that kind of puts it in line with how much you can get it off AmiAmi right now. And then, not going to lie, Matt, found a BGS um, rated nine graded card of our, you know, you, you know, Matt of Coco from Hollow Live. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. So I had to pick that one up. Matt had to pick it up. Where, shout out to the vendor because, little story, Matt. So okay. my partner and I see the different cards. They see a Pokemon Greninja card that they really want, and they told us, okay, if you pay in cash, not gonna get the get taxed so mm-hmm. you know that's when i went around try to find an, a td just because matt mm-hmm. not paying those atm fees uh-huh john i always feel sketchy using like a a set up atm yes definitely mm-hmm. Matt, not a fan mm-hmm. of atms in general uh-huh. eh, they're okay <laughs> <laughs> like if it's a non like my non-bank branch uh atm not gonna use it mm-hmm. that's just how i am like in i guess like in bank atm machine like tech has gotten to the point where i'm like actually like very impressed by where it is now no that's totally fair matt Mm -hmm. the first time i used a atm in japan a 7-eleven atm Mm -hmm. oh man and i put in my bank card and put my pin and it accepted it i pooped in my pants because i was scared (laughs) Oh, for some reason jaren the way they give you the money in those atms because like you know here i guess in north america we're used to that kind of like system where you know you you request the money and then it like feeds it out through that kind of like rolling conveyor slot right yes but then like in like you know the 7-eleven atm you know using that thing it is like in a bowl almost when it presents it yeah. to you and i was like oh this is this is weird I am definitely going to get hacked here, <laughs> but I digress. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, got some money, the Coco card, uh, you know, tax-free. And then when they were getting it out of the display, they said, hey, I'm going to knock off another $20 card, <laughs> uh, $20 off this card. So oh, got the Coco card. And my partner said, oh, you know, when you left to get the money, he totally said that, oh, these cards are really <laughs> hard to kind of sell just because the people into the wise shores especially you know they play they're not necessarily there for collecting where matt mm. i'm here <laughs> for collecting oh, man. Uh, that was my fan expo experience you know what <laughs> shout out to uh-huh. my sister because she went to we went to the retro kid booth and matt mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with retro kid but they're the ones who kind of re- like license and produce merch based on kind of Canadian television shows that, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. of our era growing up. And mm-hmm. I think for a comic, uh, for this time around, you had the original Molly from the Big Comfy Couch in the display case. Oh. And that mm-hmm. seeing Molly in a display case made me really sad for some reason. <laughs> Oh, wait, the, like, actual original, like, the actual doll or just, like, a doll of Molly? Oh, no, the actual Molly doll. Oh, man, that's actually kind of wild. A, in a display case. And then they had replica Molly dolls that, was when I was talking to the clerk, went out, like, instantly sold out, which is kind of crazy. But mm-hmm. um, who their special guest for this time was the, the two main characters of... Matt, do you remember the show Ready or Not? I remember the title. I can't actually yeah. remember what that show was about. Uh, it's a coming of age story of two teenage girls and uh, my sister, who was a adolescent girl growing up, uh, watching mm-hmm. that show show meant a lot to her. Where when we originally went to Retro Kid uh, to meet the cast and to get a photo op, uh, it was like ninety dollars. Um, but 
I've, we thought like uh, my sister was priced out, so we just went, got some merch, and when she checked out with the merch, um, since she passed the merch threshold, she was able, she was eligible to get a picture and you know just some time to oh, chop nice. it up with the cast and get a signed autograph. So uh, just seeing that was seeing her like you know get to tell her story to these. Uh, you know, actresses who played these characters was really cool. And in the meantime, I was talking to one of the retro kid clerks about the zone and how much uh, <laughs> that if PJ Phil ever does one of these, I'll be right there. <laughs> so oh, man. crossing my fingers for the future and really, that, uh, wild get. Mm-hmm. have to apologize for you because I know we were trying to add uh <laughs> Trying to get this episode sub one hour, and I just spent 15 <laughs> minutes telling you about my adventures in Fan Expo, oh, so I appreciate man. that, Matt. Mm-hmm. But Matt, mm. enough about me, enough about me spending money, enough about me going to Fan Expo 2024. Uh, not nearly enough time spent, but still a satisfying experience. So I got to ask you, Matt, what have you been up to this week? Jaren, I think one of the things that I've been following pretty closely this week is all of the news that is coming out of, I guess, Gamescom yes. and the Monster Hunter Wilds coverage. Matt, mm-hmm. was it some wild coverage? <laughs> Jaren, it's some wild coverage. Okay. That game is uh, doing some very interesting stuff. They uh, showed off a lot more, I guess, like of the actual gameplay loop. And a lot of things that I was concerned about in the episode where we kind of like talked about Monster Hunter previously has kind of mostly been answered. I think the thing that like I was the most concerned about in that episode was kind of the auto-pathing to the monsters. And now that they've kind of confirmed that it is sort of an open-world kind of uh, setup, it makes a lot more sense on why the auto-pathing is there. How so, Matt? Um, because, you know, kind of previously in Monster Hunter games, the gameplay loop is divided into your hub, where you kind of like do your your kind of maintenance. You're like, okay, you're setting up uh, what you're going to bring on your hunt. You're getting your items ready. You're you're you know building your loot or not loot, uh, your your gear and stuff. And then you select a mission, and then the game loads you into like a map of that area, and then you kind of like go find the monster in like whatever way you want there. But the way that Monster Hunter Wilds is working is that now the game isn't necessarily divided into the hub and the Monster Hunt phases. Uh, Since it's a lot more kind of open-worldy, you are able to, you know, you can start in a hub if you want to. But once you go, like, you know, hunt a monster, you can then, from, like, where you've hunted the monster, start a new mission. And then your, your mount will auto path you towards the monster that you like you've selected for that mission and you can kind of like do a lot more of your prep while your monster is moving kind of like in the same way that like you know in like what was in like wow when you're kind of like going between like you know the automated what are are they called again flight flight paths flight master nodes yeah Yeah, like you can kind of like do like inventory management and stuff there that's basically what you can do inside of like the the auto pathing now Okay. It was really nice. I know we've heard rumblings about the open world previously, so it is nice to see it confirmed. Mm-hmm. Um, did they share anything about the open world in general? Just because, Matt, mm-hmm. when I think Monster Hunter, I think, okay, I need to go to this specific area uh, and fight this big baddie. Where mm-hmm. if you put that in an open world environment, I think my biggest concern is the open world might just not feel alive if all of the focus is being put on these areas with the monsters in general. Mm-hmm. Where, from what you've seen, did you get a sense of how, I guess, just active the world is? If there's anything that really, I don't want to say, you know, encourages open world exploration, but has there been anything that you saw that, actually makes you want to engage with the open world rather than, hey, let's just use this travel path to the monster. So they were kind of limited to a certain area within the demo that they were showing off at Gamescom. Mm -hmm. But within this area, it does have like, you know, a whole bunch of traversals. You can do a whole bunch of like item gathering you can do. But what I thought was very interesting is the way they're kind of handling the monsters within the area, which is that all the monsters will just perpetually exist within that area. And an interesting thing that can happen is um, 
kind of like in in most Monster Hunter games, you could have things like having the monsters interact with each other, and you know they'll like get into like you know a a tussle with each other. They'll put damage on each other and whatnot. But while you're doing your mission, if you happen to run into another monster, you can you know start attacking them, start hunting them, but then proceed back to your mission. And when you finish your like specific mission, you can then start a quest because uh, the quests aren't really kind of like how they were before where like it's like oh go hunt this dude or go hunt like this uh monster specifically it the quest system now is like okay these are the large monsters or like you know like i guess like important monsters that are wandering in the open world right now it will then like dynamically create a quest based on those like monsters and any damage you know you've put on them when you ran into them before will be on them already. And I think an interesting thing that they kind of like integrated from Sunbreak is that um, the monsters now are kind of marked with certain like strength levels. So instead of it always kind of just being the sort of same monster, you can have like, oh, it's this monster, but it's like two or three tiers stronger than it normally would be. So you can choose to go, you know, hunt that one, or you can try to find a normal one, which I think is a very nice way to make early game monsters still relevant towards the end of the game. Or at least that seems like what they're trying to do. Okay. Sounds fair, Matt. Where Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now that we got a glimpse of, you know, the open world at work, got to ask Matt, Mm -hmm. uh, since the last update, how have the weapon reveals gone? And are there any new weapons of this type of round? Unfortunately, Jaren, there are no new weapons. Mm. I don't know. I, like, I think it's been over a decade since a new Monster Hunter weapon has been revealed. Okay. So I think people are kind of just like thirsting for, for a new weapon. They just want to, you know, see something new. I definitely do want to just like see something new as well. But I... I love the kind of, like, information gathering that everybody is doing on, like, the Monster Hunter, any kind of, like, you know, subreddit or any, like, you know, just, like, general forum for Monster Hunter. Because it's just people kind of, like, scraping through streams, being like, hey, I saw this on, like, some guy's stream, and I saw this on, like, some other guy's stream, and I don't know. I, Jordan, it was so surprising to me. To be on the Monster Hunter subreddit and then see like, oh, hey, here's some new information about uh, Monster Hunter Wilds. And it's just clips from Hollow Stars playing Monster Hunter. <laughs> Amazing, Matt. <laughs> That's incredible. Shout and out like, to the boys. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just people like analyzing uh, like their gameplay and like it's just like playing back. Oh, did this like thing actually happen here? Or are we just like, you know, imagining that happening? Or is that like a bug or something? And people just, you know, kind of like trying as much as they can to kind of get all the new move sets of the moves out and like what is and isn't possible and i don't know kind of like seeing this happen is is such a interesting thing because i always love like no matter not just like monster hunter but any kind of um game with a big gathering in general where you get to see the kind of like knowledge build up or zeitgeist of the initial kind of like exposure of the game to the public so that people can, you know, see what is and isn't actually there. And it's not just the destination, but the journey as well. It's the friends we made along the way mm-hmm. watching mm-hmm. the Hollow Star Boys playing Monster Hunter World or oh, Wilds. Wild, Wilds. Where yes, wild. you actually said something that caught my attention, Matt, in mm. that, you know, people were analyzing video clips for move sets. Mm-hmm. Where I know you said that the Monster Hunter franchise, it's been, you know, a decade since the last new weapon has come to the game. Mm-hmm. Where as someone who isn't necessarily okay, necessarily isn't the right word, who isn't into Monster Hunter, Uh to help keep things fresh, do the weapon move sets for each of the different weapon sets get updated through, you know, game to game, or are they generally the same? Game to game, it's usually like, oh, 70-ish percent of the move set is going to be the same, and then they will, you know, put some... They'll, like, remix some of the moves. They'll put in new ones and kind of, like, change the flow of the weapon. Um, like, on some stuff, it's, like, you know, like, really interesting to see. Like, the the bow is probably the weapon that has changed 
the most between Monster Hunter World and Rise to Monster Hunter Wilds because okay. it has, in essence, evolved into the magic archer from Dragon's Dogma 2 where there is just like a new mechanic of, hey, we've introduced a a thing that you can like put into the monster and now your bullets will home, or not bullets, your arrows will home into it. And that adds so much kind of like interesting gameplay because, you know, it's not like that tracker will stay on there forever. You have to like reapply it, but it costs like certain resources that they've like newly introduced towards the bow. Stuff like Insect Glaive, for example, has gone through a kind of like reversal change, I guess, for lack of a better way to say this, because um, before Monster Hunter world and rise the insect glaive was far more grounded in terms of Mm -hmm. like you know gameplay on the ground is what i mean and then in like those uh wilds and rise it became more airborne and now they moved it back towards the more grounded style so i'm kind of like i'm personally kind of disappointed in that because i loved being able to kind of just fly through the sky with insect glaive so i i i'm i'm a lot less hyped to play insect glaive uh this time around oh no Mm -hmm. but Jaren the long sword has become so much more anime. Jaren, I can't believe it took this long, but they finally added the move to long sword where you know, you like with a sword do a slash or something. Nothing happens, and then the the person like puts the sword just like halfway into the scabbard, and then when they close it, you just see all these slices fly off on the monster. Amazing, classic. It's classic anime that I I love to see on the uh, on the long sword. That's great, Matt. Matt, that mm-hmm. sounds really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so based on all the information we've had so far, mm-hmm. it, are you gravitating towards any weapon when you finally get your hands on the game? I think I'm going to be doing kind of a um, bow, I, bow, light bow gun, hunting horn. Uh, those are all things that I played like before that I want to you know, kind of go back to. But the kind of changes that they're putting into, what do you call it? The great sword and the charge blade are like very interesting to me, and I, I kind of want to like give those a try. Also, the gun lance. The gun lance looks like it's gotten a lot of uh, big buffs towards it in wilds, and I, I really want to give that one a try as well. Okay, Matt. Hmm. This is shaping up to be a beefy boy game, mm-hmm. and I don't know. Maybe this will be my first real. Uh, me dipping my toes into the Monster Hunter franchise as a whole. Man, I'm excited. Mm-hmm. So, Darren, you should gotta ask. It, it looks re- it looks really good. Mm-hmm. Before we move on, how's mm-hmm. uh, the armor sets looking, Matt? Oh, Jaren, the armor sets are looking really good. Jaren, the armor sets are no longer gender locked, so I I'm looking forward to finally being able to play a female character that wears actual armor or a male character that wears dresses. Incredible, Matt. I too am now looking forward to that, mm-hmm. but. Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. speaking about looking forward to things, there was a there was a direct last week. I know yeah. at the time of recording tomorrow, there's going to be a indie partner showcase. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know that's really old news when all our friends get to hear this uh, episode release. But really special mm-hmm. direct last week, Matt. And Matt, mm-hmm. what did you think of the Nintendo Museum Direct? Jaren, I'm very interested by the Nintendo Museum Direct. I am very much looking forward to going. I am not looking forward to the process of actually, you know, getting there and going. But but the place itself looks very, very interesting to me. Where this was initially announced at a, I think it was a full-on Nintendo Direct. Mm -hmm. Uh, Was it last year, I believe? somewhere around that yes. then, mm-hmm. that this was kind of casually announced during one of the prime Nintendo directs. And for us to have Miyamoto give us a, not necessarily tour, but kind of just a breakdown of what to expect mm-hmm. when this finally opens. And that, mm-hmm. that is definitely a Nintendo museum. But yeah. I think when going through the video, it was more or less everything I wanted out of a Nintendo museum where mm-hmm. gotta ask Matt, 
anything from that i believe it was a 13 minute showcase yeah. anything catch your attention in particular i mean jaren i i think the place looks very interesting i'm wondering i thought it looked a little bit small hmm. for um what i would expect the throughput of people being interested in going to a nintendo museum would be that's fair like i i'm worried it's going to be very cramped in there uh, once it it like officially opens up but I, I like how the place looks. I think it's like kind of like very, very, very much like uh, not a what do you call it? Not like a boring ish looking place. I, I like the kind of like you know giant controllers they have everywhere. I like the what they've decided to put inside, like you know the display cases and stuff, or what they're deciding. It seems that they're deciding to show on the what do you call it? Like just like throughout the museum, I'm interested in seeing how they are going to maybe expand on it in the future for like. Uh, you know, like maybe newer games or specific exhibits or something like that. But I'm also very interested in like that. Like they showed off a bunch of kind of like experiences that you can go through, yeah. which uh, were very interesting to me. Jaren, that giant like floor screen game looks interesting, yeah. but that's something I would never, <laughs> probably never do. So for context, mm-hmm. I believe on the first floor of the Nintendo Museum, there will be a giant screen where... You know, visitors of the museum will be able to play the traditional Japanese card game, uh, Haikunin Issue. Haikunin Issue, I think, is. is, All right. That (laughs) seems like you took that. Today was my 69th day streak of uh, (laughs) Duolingo, but based on pronunciation, you can tell I'm not talking into my (laughs) phone, but I digress. Oh, man. Um, Yeah. I know Miyamoto also said that there would be a lot of different interactive elements of Mm -hmm. the museum where Mm -hmm. while I do, while I would be interested and am interested in seeing all the different historical, you know, just memorabilia history of Nintendo, Mm -hmm. gotta admit that my Mm -hmm. brain has been rotted due (laughs) to the interactive you know, photo op museums of the, Mm -hmm. you know, say the Team Labs variety, the White Rabbit variety, where I think I'm really interested just to see what also the photo ops will be here because Mm -hmm. Matt, Mm -hmm. what gives me the most hope for the Nintendo Museum is I remember going to, I believe it was the Pokemon Center DX in Tokyo and just having Mm -hmm. that, you know, wall of Pokemon history before you enter the store. And even considering the Pokemon Center in Osaka and all the different, you know, just statues and different kind of historical elements on the perimeter of the shop before you actually entered, you know, When Nintendo kind of licenses out for these efforts, and I know the Pokemon Center is a joint, uh, Mm -hmm. is from the Pokemon Company, but uh, just seeing that attention to detail to give, you know, your consumers an experience is something that I am also looking forward to here, just to see how they put everything together, uh, just to really make you really uh, just appreciate what this brand is to so many different people, but... Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. saw a and zapper in that uh, museum direct, so yep. excited to see how those get to play. But yeah, mm-hmm. um, anything else, Matt, from the museum direct that caught your attention? Jaren, I'm concerned about the Ultra Machine game mm. because you know while it is like really cool <laughs> to be able to you know basically have a batting cage inside of a, a kind of like. I guess like a home or like room themed kind of like situation. I feel like that's so prone to, to being broken and yes. that like being such a, a hassle to, to upkeep. Um, Where mm-hmm. did you feel the same way during the segment towards the end when they were playing with the giant controllers? Jared. Oh man. I, I'm less worried about the giant controllers. Cause I think like, you know, really that's, you're you're switching out like a a giant button, which is probably less uh, work than trying to fix, you know, a printer. Which when you hit it, it it prints out like uh, a side that says like I think it was like nine thousand yen or something, or you know, the the robotics I guess or the the stuff inside the ultra machine makes it seem so much more wild to me. 
That's fair, uh, Matt. That's but fair. Jaren, I I think the thing that I want to do the most in the Nintendo Museum is to just like play with the giant Wiimote. Yes. I'm like a hundred percent sure that they honestly probably just like put a Wiimote inside the giant Wiimote. And that's like you're just like, you know, pressing buttons that like touch buttons inside the Wiimote, but I don't know. The the novelty of using a giant Wiimote to fly like I think they were playing like pilot wings or something something like, like that. just fly a plane oh man that looks so some nice dumb fun that i really want to get in on that's the photo op- opportunity i'm looking mm-hmm. for matt alba and mm-hmm. uh so yeah it was a brief tour of the nintendo museum that's scheduled to open on october 2nd 2024 in kyoto japan mm-hmm. Matt? Mm-hmm. uh when's the next round buddy I don't know, man, but like, yo, Kyoto is like basically beside Osaka, so you know, gonna gotta knock out both the Nintendo Museum and Super Mario, or like the USJ Super Mario World, and probably the same trip. That is not gonna be a good, uh, good time for Wallet Coon, because I'm really interested in seeing what the Nintendo Museum like exclusive merch is going oh, to be. Oh, yeah, because I'm assuming yeah. it. For me, Jaren, I, I think just because it's a museum, it, it feels like it would be a much more, a less flashy or like a, a much more like subtle display piece that I think I would be a lot more interested in than something I would mm-hmm. get at like the uh, Universal Studios Japan Super Mario World kind of place. That's fair, Matt. That's fair. But we'll we'll see for ourselves when <laughs> the Mistake Zone boys take uh, take another trip in Japan yeah. in uh some period. Uh, Jaren, I'm just saying, you know, if we go in 2026, a lot of the hype will have died down. Fair. So I'm hoping it wouldn't be as busy for both those places. And 2026 is the 30th anniversary for Pokemon. Ooh. So, you know, stuff's going to probably pop off there, Jaren. Think about all the, the cards you can get there. Matt. Uh-huh. I hate how when you said 2026, the first thing to pop into my sick brain was, Matt, Mm -hmm. we're going to be so, so old in 2026. (laughs) Think about that. Jared, Uh, Jared, you know, if we we work on it now, our bodies will still be okay for for another trip to Japan. We we can only hope, Matt. We can only Mm -hmm. hope. Mm -hmm. But Matt... Uh Uh-huh. Speaking about being old, mm-hmm. there is a game that came out recently that Matt, mm-hmm. my old man senses makes me terrified of playing because as someone who adored Elden Ring, Matt, mm-hmm. and who's had people say, oh, if you liked Elden Ring, you should totally check out Matt. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of questions about okay. the game that you're about to talk about. Yes. But... Mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. what have you been playing this week? Jaren, I have been playing Black Myth Wukong. And Matt, mm-hmm. this game has taken, would you say the internet, by uh, taken Steam by storm, mm-hmm. you know, breaking the hearts of Xbox players by having, you know, that statement coming out that there were some <laughs> memory issues that prevented it from being ported there. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Matt, how, how mm-hmm. many hours have you put uh, into the game so far? And what are your, and Matt, what is the game? So, Jaren, I haven't put as many hours as I wanted to into this game. I'm only at like 15 hours because, Jaren? Only 15 out, Matt. <laughs> Uh-huh. I, I think your 15 hours is more than the total combined of the last, I don't know, three games I've talked about <laughs> here on the Mistake Zone. Jared, I've wanted to play more, but this whole like past week, I have been so like out of it in terms of sleep that mm-hmm. almost like every day after, you know, after I do like my normal my normal job. I, like, pass out for three hours. Matt, Mm -hmm. I know we're supposed to be talking about video games right Uh now, uh but I feel like every time I visit my parents, Mm -hmm. I end up being a blob on my old bed, Uh and I'm usually dying at that point of, you know, just staying up late, where I think I'm 
probably five for five the last time I've visited my parents where I've just fallen asleep with the lights on oh, and man. haven't brushed my teeth. And that's how oh, man, dead yes. I get when staying there. Oh, man. Jaren, I love being in full sloth mode. <laughs> oh, man. That, old habits die mm. hard, but mm-hmm. I digress, Matt. Uh, Black Myth Wukong. Yes. Matt, what mm-hmm. is this game? Jaren, this is a game that relates to the story of uh, Journey to the West's Wukong, mm. uh, which is like a very like traditional Chinese kind of like myth that is like, you know, just very, very popular. I was very surprised, Jaren, to find out that um, the voice actor for the Chinese version of, or a Chinese, Chinese like audio version of uh, Wukong is played by a very like famous person who's like you know uh done the voice acting for a particular like Wu journey to the west uh animation which is like a really oh, cool okay. like thing to like hear that right. like it's for china the iconic voice for wukong which i feel like i really wish i i could like kind of like feel how that like really felt for like the chinese audience mm-hmm. that's cool mm-hmm. so i believe correct me if i'm wrong that this was uh, developed by a Chinese studio as well, where mm-hmm. I think a lot of you know news reports have been stating that this what is essentially um, you know the Chinese market's entry into the AAA gaming space. Yeah, and what a heck of an entrance of what I'm hearing, Matt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Where Jared, it's, it's really good. <laughs> okay, so now that we have kind of the background behind it, what is the actual game, Matt? Okay, so you are playing as a non-named monkey who is like kind of just referred to in game as like the destined one. The kind of like plot of the story is that you know Wu Kong has like quote unquote died, but he's like scattered himself into um, I think they said six relics, and it's your job to like you know go get these relics to revive him. And the game itself is. I understand why a lot of people are saying, hey, if you like Elden Ring, you are going to like this game. Mm -hmm. Because kind of like the world design, the style of storytelling and the like kind of like enemies are all very Dark Souls or Elden Ring like in in design. Like the way that they all interact is so quintessentially Elden Ring. And souls that like I was surprised that the character you play as themselves doesn't play like a souls or Elden Ring type player really? or character. How so, Jaren? They play or the character that you play as plays so much more like I don't know, like a Kingdoms of Amalur character or a uh, honestly, it feels like I'm playing a Grand Blue Fantasy based on the way that like the character specifically controls because um the game does kind of use the hey here's your light attack on square here's your heavy attack on triangle you know you have your dodge on circle you have your jump on x and then you have your hey here's your trigger buttons they turn all your things into modifiers where now like all your face buttons do different um magics and stuff like that and you're kind of like going through skill trees uh, when you level up to, you know, hey, here, like improve your health, improve your stamina, improve your mana, improve your spell cooldowns. Hey, we're going to give you um, stances that let you change the way that uh, your light attack and heavy attack work. We are going to, you know, let you upgrade your spells and stuff by, you know, either make their duration longer, make them do things like slightly differently. If you use them in like you know X situation or Y situation, they'll they'll work a little differently. The game is like very customizable in terms of how you want to play the character itself, and I I think it's doing like a very good job of um making everything feel pretty good in that sense. Okay, so I guess instead of your more would you say methodical you know Souls Light mm-hmm. uh, Elden Ring playstyle, it does kind of resemble more character action in terms of kind of Mm -hmm. more fast-paced combat which Mm -hmm. does sound really cool as well but 
Again, Matt, when you make comparisons to Elden Ring, gotta ask, mm-hmm. where does the difficulty range kind of fall into? Is it something that is as brutal as something like from from Soft, or does it have a more casual approach to it? I think that this game is like considerably easier than like Elden Ring and like any other Souls game, uh, but I do think that it's harder than any other like standard character action game. Uh, I do, however, think that the boss designs in this are a lot more interesting in terms of like how you're fighting them. At least for like the cha- the bosses within like the first three chapters, which is what I've like done so far. Okay, how so, Matt? Because like I think they all vary themselves a lot more compared to something like uh, Elden Ring in particular, because you know Elden Ring has been the most recent one, and I think that. One thing that I was very surprised about, about Black Matu Kong, is how many bosses there are in this game, Jaren. Mm. Or, like, you know, kind of like boss-style fights. Because the amount of times that I've just been wandering around the map and then just fallen into a boss fight, because they don't do the kind of, like, um, fog gate kind of thing. Right. It, they kind of do just like, hey, here's, like, a door. If you happen to, like, pass through it, you're, you're starting a boss fight. Okay. And... The kind of like unique the amount of like bosses that I've gone through is is like pretty nice in terms of uh what you're doing like whether you're even if you're fighting things that are you know kind of like humanoid shape they're all very different in how they play whether it's like oh you're fighting like this like water snake dude so you know you're you're dealing with a lot of you know kind of sweeping more more so like sweeping attacks or you're dealing with like a dude who is able to do counters against you so you have to be very aware of his tells or you know you're fighting like just like a a bear that can fly which i thought was like a very interesting fight um you i i think that like there's a lot of like kind of like very unique fights that they're doing in this game and it kind of like prompts you more into kind of like doing i guess like kind of like trying to find a good way to fight them Instead of like more specifically, like you just hoping your your build or whatever really works against this particular boss, because mm-hmm. uh, I think like a very nice thing is that one you can respect very freely. Uh, the respect is like nice, totally nice, free, nice, uh, which which I love to see. But two is that like even if you aren't specifically specced into a, uh, I guess like certain play style, for lack of a better way to say it. The play style itself is still, like, very valid. Um, I think the way that the game works is that when you're specking into stuff, you're getting more options rather than more specifically power. Right. So the stuff that you you don't even decide to spec into is still pretty much on par in terms of power. You're just not going to have as many options in it. But, like, you know, when the style of play that you decided to go with isn't really working out. It's very easy to, without even, like, respecting, within, like, that same round of fighting, switch to a different strategy. Okay. Well, Matt, mm-hmm. so, again, with the, I guess, comparisons to Elden Ring, I have to also ask, and, mm-hmm. you know, might be unfair comparisons as well, where I think one of the, you know, aspects of Elden Ring that people did enjoy was even if the difficulty was there, you could really just leave, go do something else and come back, you know, just stronger because you Mm -hmm. you, in exploring this open world, you're finding ways to get, you know, either new spells or just being able to level up where Mm -hmm. in the case of Wukong, uh, how is the open world and do you can you find yourself in a similar situation of oh this boss might be a bit tough can i grind it out and then potentially brute force my way through it down the road yeah i think you can kind of like grind it out because um Jordan, i think one like very big difference between uh, this game and elden ring is that uh, when you die in this game you don't lose anything oh not mm-hmm. speaking my language right now jaren for people who haven't played a Souls game or a Souls-like game, I think this is a very good kind of, like, entry into it because it feels like a very familiar kind of, like, standard character action game, but everything else is so Dark Soul or so Souls-like. Um, like, you know, you have your equivalent of an Estus. You have your equivalent of the, you know, upgrading Estus. You have a 
bunch of equipment that you can decide to like craft and like build towards and I don't know, it, it feels like a very good stepping stone into that style of game. So yeah, because of that, like I think it's a very good kind of like stepping stone into Souls like games. I think though that like Jared, the world itself looks very, very nice. Hmm. Um like the kind of design of everything graphically, everything is designed so nicely. But Jaren, my biggest gripe with this game is that it is spamming invisible walls. Oh no. Really? Mm-hmm. Like how bad how bad does it get? I I honestly really, really don't like how many invisible walls that I'm running into because I think um maybe an issue with the way that they designed the maps is that it feels more like they designed an area and then they decided, hey, this is where the player will play. Right. Rather than like, hey, like this is the path the player's gonna go through, let's design around it. Like the thing for me that um I really don't like is that Jaren, when I was uh playing through this game, I realized that like when I got to the end of one of the chapters, that uh the game kind of like tracks um all the bosses that you've like fought and all like the enemies, major enemies and stuff that and NPCs that you've you know encountered in like this kind of like log book. And I realized that like when I got to the end of this chapter, there were so many gaps in my thing. And I realized that I basically missed half of the content in this uh, chapter by the when I got to the end of it. So I decided to like go back, like double back through that chapter to see everything. And right, an issue with like yeah, like I was saying, is that um because like you have so much freedom to explore, like the maps themselves are kind of designed to have branching paths within them, and whether the paths lead to like a totally new place or they just lead to like a treasure chest. They all kind of look the same if you if don't really know where you are. And there's no mini map in the game, so you can't really um use something like that to navigate. But like the biggest issue I think is that like the game itself, you know, it it tries to do the things of like, hey, here's like, you know, we have torches here. So like, you know, we're trying to draw the player's attention to go into this direction. And I think that is totally fine. That's totally like a valid way to you know, kind of, like, do signposting for where the player is supposed to be going. But my issue is that they don't, like... I don't know if it's still called signposting for this, but they don't signpost for areas where you're you're not able to go. Hmm. Um, and what I mean by this, for example, is that, like, let's say you're in a forest area, and, you know, you're kind of just, like, walking down to a path, and then on the left, you, you happen to see, hey, here's a clearing over here. And, you know, you try to, like, go into the clearing, but you're just hit with an invisible wall. And... The the issue that I have is that it's, it's like not, I like marked in a way, where you would know that there's an invisible wall there to begin with, like it is just kind of like you know here's an open, like area between two trees that it seems like you could walk through. It doesn't have like a thing where it's like oh you know a tree has fallen and like you know, it's very clear that you can't walk this way or there's bushes or like debris in the way that means you can't walk this way but you can still kind of like you know see the scenery past this area. Uh, which it does like a lot, a lot. Man, um, that's that's actually really rough. Mm-hmm. Like that is like definitely like a thing that I really, really dislike, especially with how vertical the game tries to be. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> then like realizing, hey, you cannot, you know, kind of like jump onto this like path to get to the um, to like you know get further up this way. Like you can't jump on the sca- scaffolding to get up to like this enemy that's like shooting you from a roof. And, like, I honestly do think that the that kind of, like, invisible wall design is, like, the weakest or the biggest issue I have with this game. Because um, even in boss fight rooms, there was one particularly egregious one that I really didn't uh, like. Mm-hmm. Which is that, like, there is a boss that kind of, like, does these... Does an attack that sends a shockwave along the floor. And you can, you know, just, like, jump over the shockwave to avoid it. Or there are like these certain like kind of like uh kind of like rocks that you can stand on that allow you to kind of just like stand there and the shockwaves like pass harmlessly beneath you. And there was like one of these rocks on the very edge of the arena that actually isn't in the edge of the arena. It there's just no. an invisible wall in front of it. I went to go jump onto it, I slipped, I didn't get to it at all, and I, I died. <laughs> That's rough, Matt. Matt, mm-hmm. that seems like a really big oversight as well. Yeah, like, I I think if they just didn't have, like, you know, that 
that rock graphic there. <laughs> I, I like yeah. I I kind of just wish it wasn't in your periphery to see and hope that like that would have worked. But right, like man, that's that is man. honestly yeah. The the kind of like invisible wall design is is something I really really uh, don't like about this game. Mm-hmm. But I think that that is really, you know, other than like a like I've had like one crash at desktop. Um, but like other than that, like I think the game itself is actually like pretty, like pretty good. Um, I think that there are gonna be people who have issues with the way the game does its kind of storytelling, because it is it's very Dark Souls or Souls like in that regard as well. Where it, how do I say this? It, it feels like, you know, you never have the full information until the end of the chapter, and that's when like you know everything clicks, right. and when you're you know like kind of getting like all this um information afterwards that that makes everything like you know kind of, yeah like make more sense and oh it, it feels like you're dra- dropped like a third of the way into the story and then you have to like figure out all the context as you're finishing the rest of that story man but, Matt, mm-hmm. that sounds rough but... yeah but like, and, like going through it is like very interesting like it does have a lot of nice kind of um i guess like interactions if you understand the story itself mm-hmm. like there was one um boss that I was fighting where you know kind of going into that fight I was kind of doing the fight normally and then I kind of realized a kind of story bit regarding this boss and there is like a ability that you get earlier in the in the chapter that is related to this boss I switched to that ability I used it against the boss and I kind of like that they Kind of do the thing where, like, the boss has the dialogue of, oh, why do you know how to do that sort of thing? <laughs> Which is, I, I don't know, like, a really small thing that I really appreciate when, uh, like, any anything, like, decides to to, to, to work with. So good, Matt. Matt mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I also like when games are able to kind of just acknowledge um, just different play styles. Or, Matt, my favorite, mm-hmm. you having a ability that you might, or you shouldn't have at that moment, or <laughs> oh, you know, the boss might be surprised that you have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Always a personal favorite, mm-hmm. but that seems mm-hmm. like you're enjoying this game, even though you have only 15 hours. But mm-hmm. want to kind of circle back to a point you briefly touched upon, just to confirm, uh-huh. uh, you're playing on the PC. Yes. And how has the, I guess, just overall performance been for you? The performance has been pretty okay. I've um just been playing it basically on a custom kind of like graphic uh setting between medium and high. Okay. And I've like been able to keep it at uh sixty frames, uh at one forty four P using like a twenty seventy, which is I guess like pretty old now, but like I'm surprised mm-hmm. it's like able to keep a reasonably constant like sixty ish. Okay. Um but yeah, it's like running pretty nicely. I Jaren, I, I think the game is like doing like a a phenomenal job of like being able to to use my my 2070 to to output like the kind of graphic style that it's uh putting out matt Mm -hmm. that makes me feel good about it as well Mm -hmm. where i think that's always what worries me especially with some big pc releases of will i be able to run it relatively well and well I think I like to believe my uh, machine still has a few good years left, Matt. Mm-hmm. Everything time time's going by too fast. Mm-hmm. Too Jared, fast. I'm just I'm waiting for that uh, 5090 when when that 5090 gets announced. I I, I oh. think I might go in. Okay, I I know for me I I typically end up skipping, uh, for lack of a better term, generation. So this might be another mm-hmm. time where I'm looking for an upgrade as well. But mm-hmm. I digress, Matt. Uh, Black Myth Wukong. Uh, this also seems like a game that you will be uh, kind of checking in over the next few weeks. But mm-hmm. for now, at the very least, based on your first 15 hours, Matt, what are your initial closing thoughts? It's a really great game if you, you know, like the soul kind of souls like uh, gameplay style. It's a really great game if you kind of just want a, you know, like I think like a pretty reasonable challenge. Uh, the storytelling in it, like I said, is like a little confusing, but I, it pays itself off once you get to the end of each of the chapters. I kind of like, I've liked basically every NPC I've come across. They've, they've been all played like very well. Even like the enemy, um, like antagonists are all played like pretty well. 
uh, other than the the maps being kind of like weird in terms of their invisible walls, the the game is actually like very 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 solid. Actually, one thing I actually <laughs> one other thing that I uh, don't like about this game, um, Jaren, do you have like a a staff as a weapon? And what you can do is that you can upgrade the staff to like a tree. Um, you can get multiple staffs throughout the game, and they can like be upgraded to their own separate trees. But Jared, I think it really sucks that like you know if you decide to push a uh, weapon down a certain path, if you want to go back to another path, you have to you know pay the the price to forge it there. Mm-hmm. But if you wanted to like switch back to the one you were initially on, you have to pay to like reforge it back to that thing. Oh, which kind of sucks. That's kind of rough, and mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's because it's pretty late right now, but when you said that you can, um, you know, turn it into a tree, I literally thought you were swinging around a big tree trunk oh. as a staff <laughs> at some point. Jordan, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens just because of, like, you know, like the fact that the game lets you, you know, in lore extend the staff, I wouldn't be surprised if you can turn it into a tree like staff at some point. I guess my final question is. Are- is the staff your only primary weapon, or are there any other weapons that you can explore? Uh, the staff is like basically your only uh pri- the only weapon you're going to be using. Okay, um, fair. You do like within the game have the ability to transform yourself into um, other characters, and they have their own weapons. But like specifically for like your main character themselves, you're going to be using the staff. Like ninety five percent of the game. Okay. Mm-hmm. And okay, final final question, Matt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are there par- is there parrying in this game? Um. Yeah, Jerry. You you are able to parry. You are able to like perfect dodge. Um. I have kind of leaned into a perfect dodgy kind of a play style, where I try to you know maximize the amount of, I guess like stuff I get out of perfect dodging. But you can definitely like lean into other styles. Um, Jaren, the spells in this game are all like wildly, wildly game breaking to some point. Um, nice. Just what I, I wanted to hear, man. Mm-hmm. Jaren, I, I really appreciate that this game has a stun spell. Like, it's literally you cast this spell, it's the first spell you get. You cast this spell and it just locks the enemy in place for like incredible a certain amount of time depending on the enemy yeah it's it's really good uh if you decide to like you know expand on that it's it's really good jaren i jaren there's a spell that lets you i feel like this is a spoiler because like you get this in the you get to see the spell in the intro uh when you're kind of like doing the kind of um hey this is this is your most powerful form and then we're gonna reset you to zero you get right. this uh, spell that like lets you summon clones of yourself. Amazing. And Jared, if you decide to spec into this spell, it gets ridiculously strong. <laughs> Matt, like, uh-huh. just the amount of, I guess, freedom in a way that you're mm-hmm. telling about this combat system is making me really excited to play. But sorry, before I cut you uh-huh. off, Matt. Jared, I, it's so wild because I, I didn't spec into this style, but like I saw somebody like talking about it. If you hard spec into the style, those um, clones of yourself can cast spells, and one of the spells they can cast is the stun spell. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. So wild. I need to play this game now. I, Matt, I know mm-hmm. we were talking about our uh, PCs earlier, but I think Black Nymph Wukong is definitely making a case for me to you know keep an eye out on a hopefully slightly discounted ps5 maybe mm-hmm. that pro mm-hmm. that's been rumored for so long now uh because you know this game in a uh, stellar blade still calling that still oh, calling man, man but... jared i can't can't wait till pc release of stellar blade me neither but that mm-hmm. anything else for this week for black with wukong oh i guess like oh yeah one last thing jared you can fully level to a point where you have everything unlocked uh amazing which is which is really cool. <laughs> okay. And that definitely mm-hmm. a game we'll probably check in in the next few weeks as well as you mm-hmm. play more uh, and just discover more and really upgrade your arsenal. But yeah, that is Black Myth Wukong, available now uh, on Steam and uh, PlayStation 5. Uh, mm-hmm. Sorry, Xbox fans. 
Someday, someday, probably. Hopefully, hopefully we fix that memory leak. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. before we sign off, we have to get through. Not that that's a bad thing, but Matt, mm-hmm. it's time for our weekly Don't Match Me Challenge, where mm-hmm. we bring to our friends, you know, five category, five questions, possibly related to something we discussed earlier in this episode. And the whole goal is for you, our friends, to pick an answer to our questions and just simply don't match us. Again, Mm -hmm. uh, normal mode is don't match me, but let's say hard mode is don't match us. Mm -hmm. But uh, earlier on this episode, Matt, we discussed the Nintendo Museum opening this October in Kyoto. So, Mm -hmm. Matt... Mm-hmm. For this week's Don't Match Me Challenge, this will be uh, related to museums. Mm-hmm. And Matt, mm-hmm. starting things off, let's go with name something you typically associate with museums. Ooh. Essentially, some, when you think of a, of a museum, what do you usually associate with that thought? Mm-hmm. And let's go... This can be anything you find in the museum, any exhibits, uh, any pieces of art, etc. But uh, name something you typically associate with a museum in five, four, three, two, one. Matt, mm-hmm. if you or your fr- or any of our friends said dinosaur bones, Ooh. you're out. Sharon, it's not dinosaur bones, but people bones, because I, I thought of the sarcophagus. Oh, fair, fair. Mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. good call, good call. Mm-hmm. But uh, question number two. Uh, mm-hmm. My favorite part of the museum, uh, this is related to it. Mm-hmm. Name a type of souvenir you usually find in a museum gift shop. Ooh. You know, once you have done your, you know, your stroll through the museum, you hopefully learned something new, appreciated something new. You find yourself in a gift shop. What's one type of souvenir you can usually find in said gift shop? Mm. So let's go in five, four, three, two, one. Matt, mm-hmm. if you or any of our friends said a print of a featured portrait or a portrait print, Ooh. you were out. Jared, I'm so, I've been like I feel like adjacent to both of your answers. Okay, because I said a figure of a like a miniaturized version of a statue. Ooh, that those are also good too. Those mm-hmm. are also good too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, shout out to other things I associate with Matt. My original answer for this mm-hmm. was going to be a fish pen because Matt, <laughs> for some reason, every time I'm in a museum gift shop, I'll find I'll look at their pens, and there's mm-hmm. usually one of a fish. Classic. Uh, Jared, I I know like it's not specific to like a museum, but whenever I think about a gift shop, I always think of like you know that really kind of like dumb shirt of like so and so went to this place and all they got me was a dumb T shirt. <laughs> Incredible shirt, Matt. And Matt, oh, sometimes man. you can find in a museum. Oh man, Matt. Mm-hmm. Uh, question number three. We've been saying the word museum a lot, but uh-huh. Matt. There mm. are different types of museums, you know, museum themes, if you will. So uh-huh. for question three, just name any type of museum, any uh, theme, Ooh. any focal point, any base, any foundation. Just name a type of museum in mm-hmm. five, four, three, two, one. If you said a maritime museum, you're out. Ooh. Jaren, I just went with an art museum because I, I think I'm not fancy enough <laughs> to know other museum types. That, that's, that's a safe call. That's a safe mm-hmm. call. Safe mm-hmm. call. Um, you know, that's a safe call. And that worked out. Uh, mm-hmm. Other museum types that could have been, uh, you know, selected. Uh, history museum. Mm-hmm. Uh, military and war museums. Not, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, pop-up museums. Science museums. A lot of different oh. types of museums, Matt. I never considered a science museum. Is, uh, is Ontario Science Center considered a museum? Matt, is the Ontario Science Center even open still? 
Jared, I don't know. I feel like I've been seeing so much news about hey, how, how like I don't know. It's it's broken. They're trying to turn it into like a parking lot. Like I don't know what's going on with that place anymore. Sad, Matt. Sad. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But on to question four because I I can't be bothered to ruin my childhood by searching if it's not. <laughs> uh-huh. Matt, <laughs> simple. Uh-huh. Name a movie that features a museum. Uh, God, <laughs> <laughs> Matt, a lot of movies out there. And a lot of movies that deal with museums. So, uh-huh. name a movie that features a museum. In five, four, three, two, one. Matt uh-huh. <laughs> had to go with the obvious. Uh, had no. to go <laughs> with night at the museum. Oh man, Jared, I literally could not think of another museum movie than that. <laughs> oh no, did you also go with night at the museum, Matt? Yes, I, I also went with Night at the Museum. Ah, I'm sorry. Matt, I'm sorry. My condolences. I should oh, have man. went to save you, Matt, with my uh-huh. original thought of Black Panther. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, Matt. yeah. Jared, I don't know why, when I tried to think of a movie that wasn't Night at the Museum, I thought, hey, does Paul Blart Mall Cop take place in a museum? But it definitely doesn't. Matt, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure there is a museum of national treasure. Right? Oh, man. Yeah, there has to be. Not a lot of museum movies, but I can't really think. Matt, there's, there was probably a, a museum in one of the Fast and Furious movies. Mm-hmm. Matt, oh, if yeah, you just said Fast and Furious, I would have I, I would <laughs> accepted that as well. Oh, but, man. Matt, mm-hmm. the final mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. Because we are a video game adjacent uh, audio podcast. Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. simple. Name a video game archaeologist. Ooh. Not, um, some you know, if something belongs in a museum, sometimes someone <laughs> has to find oh, that no. thing that belongs in a museum. So easy peasy, hopefully. Name a video game archaeologist. In five, four, three, oh, two, one. Matt, mm-hmm. I went with the professor of archaeology oh. at. Uh, Gresson Heller University, our boy, Professor Layden. Oh, oh, wait, he's an archaeologist? Matt, he's the professor of archaeology, so I'm going to assume oh. that's also an archaeologist. I never considered what his, like, real-ass <laughs> job was. Oh, man. So if you said Professor Layden, you're out. Jaren, I, I, I just said uh, Laura Croft, because I know she, she does museum <laughs> shit. <laughs> Fair enough, Matt. Not other, mm-hmm. uh, you know, would have accepted, of course, Indiana Jones, mm-hmm. uh, Nathan Drake. Uh, who else we got? We got Reno Jackson of uh, WoW Hearthstone. Uh, That's his fame. name. I was trying to remember what that guy's name was. <laughs> Matt, it belongs in a museum, said mm-hmm. uh, Reno Jackson. Uh, and I can't think of anything else, but there's probably others. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. probably others. And Matt, mm-hmm. this episode belongs in a museum of <laughs> friendship. Oh, that has been this week's uh, Don't Match Me Challenge and this week's The Mistake Zone. Uh-huh. As always, I want to thank one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba, for joining me this week and editing this podcast. And Matt, mm-hmm. playing some Black Myth Wukong, so we had something to talk about this week. Hey, thanks, man. And as always, Jared, I want to thank you for hosting this podcast, bringing us our Don't Match Me Challenge, and, you know... Exposing exposing a uh, wallet gun to the the dangers of Fan Expo. Ah, <laughs> uh, Matt. Mm-hmm. Want to thank uh, Fan Expo. Uh, mm-hmm. Want to thank uh, Mitsureya. Mm-hmm. Again, want to thank uh, Peachy Peru on Instagram for selling me <laughs> said Mitsureya print. I mm-hmm. uh, want to thank Wallet Coon. Uh, Matt. Want to mm-hmm. thank Coco for being immortalized <laughs> in this card I purchased. Mm-hmm. Oh. And- What's Jared, up, Matt? I, I want to throw a thanks out to uh, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp because uh, oh, it just damn. got announced that it's got getting end of service in uh, November of this year. Matt, are you gonna? Is is it true that you can have a? There's a buy-in price to play offline. Oh, I didn't hear about that. Honestly, I was like surprised that like it's getting close. So I thought Animal Crossing Pocket Camp would be like a thing that they'd be able to like keep up for a long time. Like, basically forever. Well, maybe uh, this is something to look uh, into for next week. Matt, Mm -hmm. I want to shout out 
to the Bang Dream worldwide server developers. Uh, oh, no. That is, it's, it's rough out there. It's rough out there. <laughs> Keep your heads up. I know the internet oh. is not a nice place right now. but uh, I thought you were that, about to say that like the, the global servers for Bang Dream are going to close. That mm-hmm. might be looking that way. Oh, where, no. again, uh, my go is supposed to come to the game. Uh, around the end of July, uh, technical difficulties happened, Matt. Uh, that was delayed. Mm-hmm. And I think earlier last week, they said, hey, we're still working on it. You know, some update. Uh, you know, we have a new team. You know, there was a transition period. You know, we're working out the kinks. So there hasn't been a new event in quite some time. So we're going to, you know, do the Valentine's Day event uh, next week. Uh, just mm. because there's no story oh, there, minimal translation, uh, mm-hmm. and just some new content to give to the players because it's been pretty barren after this, what was it, close to two, three weeks of no new content. And Matt? Mm-hmm. Hours later, <laughs> <laughs> there was an update to this update saying, hey, uh, uh-huh. we're still running into issues, so we won't be pushing out that Valentine's Day event. Good, good, and good. And my goo is still um, on the horizon. So keep your head up, uh, Bang Dream Worldwide team. Oh, man. Uh, but yeah, Matt, that's everything new with me. That's everything new for you. And Matt, mm-hmm. gotta apologize. Don't think this is a sub-hour episode, but maybe next mm-hmm. week, Matt. Maybe, maybe next week. week. Maybe next week. Jared, I don't think I'm gonna have anything new for next week, so <laughs> good chance. We'll see, Matt. We'll see. But until then, please take it away. This has been the Mistake Zone, and we're all out of banks protecting us from our own purchases. I mean, I would have flagged it. <laughs>